Hi, everybody. I'm Karina Lansing from Pacific Northwest National Lab. I'm a software architect, and we develop a lot of software for users to help them integrate with HPC computing facilities and services and manage all their data and provenance and try to make it easy. So that's my main thing is I try to make the user interface and everything simple for users. I'm really user focused. Um, I am just started recently on a new initiative um, at PNNL called, well, it's not new, but I'm new to it, Chemical Imaging Initiative, and they wanted to utilize some of my software that I've developed, and I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, and so the very uh, the objectives, before you know, I even started integrating with my software, I wanted to get familiar with what the goals of the initiative were. And their, their main goals are to develop new capabilities for in-situ molecular scale imaging. So basically what they want to do is they have all these different instruments and measures for, for viewing these molecular scale reactions going on right away, and they want to improve not only the instrumentation, but the processing going on with this imaging so that the big goal is they can actually influence the reactions while they're happening. So as they're taking these rapid fire, we have some, some really, really great researchers that are working on these, you know, major streams of data that are going to be made, actually like making movies of what's going on in the reaction so that we can, we can actually influence the sample while they're actually running the imaging. So in order to reach that long-term goal, um, we want to go towards real-time analysis of all of our data that's coming off the instruments. And of course, we're going to greatly increase the data volumes that we have. So um, we have to really focus on huge data. And they want to do a multimodal analysis, a part of the analysis where we could actually have uh, different instruments running on the same sample that we can overlay over the top to get our better uh, overview of the particular reaction going on. And all the software that we want to use, we want it to be based on an open framework so we can share it with the whole community. So in this particular case, we have many scientists that are part of this initiative, and they're all developing specific software, and they're all working on their little tools. Um, so I was called in to kind of help integrate some of these things into a bigger framework and start actually automating some of the processes into pipelines. Um, in this particular example, we had one specific set of users that were using um, microtomography at the APS here at Argonne. And um, th we thought, oh, we'd, we had heard, oh, we should try Globus Online because it's really fast and it'll say, because we didn't have that fast transport capability. Um, and we thought this particular group of users would be an excellent use case just for us um, to develop or to, to work with um, Globus Online at a programmatic level, so not just their web pages, but actually programming to their APIs, and then test how it works and see if we wanted to pull it into some of our larger software infrastructure. So their current situation is the user, and they've been a few times to APS. They go to APS, they generate a, a few terabytes of data, they have to um, dump all the data on a hard drive and take it home, usually for analysis. Um, we, we would like to give them a more near-time or, or real-time processing on their data so that they can actually, the, the ideal goal would be if they could actually see the full visualization of their sample before um, the sample degrades because of the electron beam so that they could actually make changes to the analysis methods and rerun it through um, as quickly as possible. But we have a, a little bit of a problem right now is that all of our, we have a lot of research on these visualization tools and we have specific tools for this particular group, um, one in particular biofilm viewer, so it's very tailored to this type of data. And all of the code so far are all written for Windows and they require like a super beefed up Windows environment which, you know, we can't, it's hard to install and configure and so we really Ideally, we have to do this at PNNL. Um, so that was our challenge. Can we get the data back to PNNL fast enough that we can do all the analysis at PNNL where they're used to doing it? So, um, so what they would do is they'd run the instrument, the detector machine. They would go and take the plug in a thumb drive and copy a few slices over that. Well, they'd run the reconstructions that were available at APS take a few slices, bring it back to our laptop, look at a few pictures, and they would that's all they could really use to make their decisions. And then they would have to load everything up on a hard drive and mail that home, and they were telling me horror stories about like one time they actually 
thought their package was a dangerous substance because of a recent bomb threat or something, and so their like package was in isolation for a month, and nobody knew where it was, and it took them forever before they even got their data so they could start doing any detailed processing. So what we decided to try was to come up with a near real-time streaming mechanism based on the Globus Online API. And so we created a little streaming utility, a little Java application that we put on our user's desktop. And it used the transfer API, and particularly the recursive option, which is like doing a remote rsync over SSH. It was very, very simple. So Globus Online did all the hard work for us. So all we really needed to do was um, make it really, we made it easier for our users so they didn't have to log into the endpoints. We did all that through code, and so we just cached all their passwords for them. So it was really easy for them. They just started the tool, and then they would, when they wanted to go, they would put the path on the source destination and they wanted to start monitoring, hit the go button, and it would just start um, calling periodically, ca calling this um, recursive transfer that would do like an rsync that would automatically transfer all the data back to PNNL. Um, and it went straight to our high performance institutional computing cluster pick where we have all our tools installed on. Um, and then there, also connected on pick, we built up this really super buffed up Windows VM that had, you know, tons of memory and GPU and um, uh, lots of uh, processors and everything so they could do their codes on there, at least for now, because we, we didn't have time to redo any of their code. Um, and so we just tested this just in March over um, the three-day beam time that Aaron Miller's team had. And so here's kind of a picture of what the architecture looked like. Um, so they had their laptop in the lab. They, they used our little streaming transfer tool. They just, when they were ready, when the instrument started, they just hit start. And that's all they did. And they just left it running. Um, and then the instrument wrote to the detector node that through the shared file system at APS, their um, Go endpoint was a machine called Clutch. So, or it was, that's the name, Clutch. So uh, we also have a data transfer node at PNNL. Um, and we had a share, we have multiple shared file systems for the sake of simplicity, I'm just showing one, which is Lustre. But we did have drives mounted directly from DTN to our shared file system, so um, we didn't have to do anything fancy. We could actually browse all those Lustre paths directly from the Globus Online um, API. And um, then also connected to the, our file system was our Windows High Performance VM. And then what the users would do for right now is they would just remote desktop to that VM and then they would run all their visualization tools from their laptop. So, and um, our initial tests were really good. You know, the, the transfer rates were like 400 plus megabits a second. And uh, the instrument they were running was actually fairly slow. The detector they were using was only writing about nine to 10 megabytes a second. So we had no problems with Globus Online keeping up with that amount of data. So we had a few minor issues, but before I start on this, this section, I just want to say that, you know, we threw this together really fast in like two weeks. So we were super impressed with how easy it was to get this stuff set up. Um, but given our ignorance that this is actually our first time ever using any form of Globus. So, we, you know, we're brand new newbies. So some of these mistakes were probably our own fault because we didn't know what we were doing. But considering we were able to fix them so quickly, we were super happy. So. Um, Globus Online, the API was a little bit different to us, especially the JSON uh, commands with the authentication piece. That was a little confusing, so we definitely needed help, but the, the Globus developers, Globus Online developers were awesome. We sent them an email and they would reply within, you know, like half hour. So we got all those worked out. Um, authentication, like I said, that's definitely the most complicated part. We didn't, we don't have an SSO set up at PNNL at all. We didn't have time to do any of that. So we were just like, well, we'll just have to get passwords on each one. And so in our little tool, we just cached them for us, for them. So they didn't have to remember their passwords and they were fine with that. Um, we had a couple of weird little authentication sometimes when we would use the API to authenticate, we'd get some 503 errors and, but then we just retry it and it would work fine. So I don't know still if that was again, what a programming problem on our end, but, um, it, it wasn't a roadblock at all. So our, probably our biggest little problem we ran into, which wasn't, I mean, given that we threw this together so quickly, we didn't even really do a, any major beta testing. So like Aaron was our beta tester, so it really turned out pretty well. We had one little incident where we actually locked out her account. She was running the Globus Online tra streaming transfer for like t over two days. Everything was fine, so it was on the third day. And it just so happened that some other user at PNNL decided to create a folder 
in her in the folder tree that we were syncing, um, and of course this is back to the bane of our existence, which is Linux permissions, and all these users have the same group, but by default they don't get group right privileges, and our sysadmins didn't want us to set their UMask, and so they have to remember after they're done transferring that you have to do you know chmod group plus write, or otherwise nobody else can re write any data in their folders, and you know so th this was a we didn't have time to resolve that issue, but we thought Aaron was going to be the only one syncing the data, and then after we were all done, we, would, we could just do that manually. So, but apparently someone went in there and created a folder, which then caused a permission issue. So when we did our, what we were doing is just once a minute, we were just calling the transfer with the recursive op option. Well, apparently when one of those folders had a write permission because of access error, um, it just kept retrying. And so the, the, tra the, the actual transfer request did not complete. And so all those transfers were like backed up on our log, on our queue. Um, and we, we actually, it actually then stopped all transfers for a while, but the Globus team was great. We, they fixed it really fast. So it was only a couple hours where there were no transfers going on. And then once we turned it back on, we also switched it because the API does allow you to, you know, check when the previous transfer is complete. So we changed it. So instead of just automatically doing it every minute, we would look at the status of the previous transfer and only call it again once the transfer had previously completed. And then that seemed to fix that problem. She still got all her data back to PNNL. So it wasn't a major roadblock at all. Um, one thing we thought, but this could be ignorance on our part because we didn't know how to use the share API. What we'd like to do is, because some of the transfer API looks a lot like shell commands as far as like doing an LS and stuff. It, we thought, oh, if we could do more shell-like commands, like for example, the chmod, you know, after we did the, the, uh, the sync call, we could just change the permissions just to make sure that there were no problems if there were like any other users that just happened to be transferring data into that same area at the same time. Um, and then the other little thing is um, if we could, when we made a transfer request, if we could send a parameter to say whether we wanted an email notification on that transfer or not, because she got a whole lot of email. We just made a rule for her and it redirected it to a folder so she didn't have to, but there were, you know, like over the course of three days, she got a few thousand email. And, um, and then of course, most of this problem though was on our end that we need to work with our users to try to get a little bit more, them to get more comfortable with us that they would let us help them to read help them parallelize some of their code. Because definitely our processing code on our end can definitely get faster. So overall, everybody was super happy. Our users, Erin was super happy. She was telling everyone at PNNL how great it was. Um, and, and especially considering we threw it together in a couple weeks, I was, I was super happy from a programmer's perspective. Um, so in three days, we transferred 1.6 terabytes of data over, which was 71 data sets. Um, they decided, it's, her data sets are complicated, but she has some that are regular and some she uses this very special processing pipeline that she only runs at PNNL. So the regular ones, she just used the reconstruction pipeline that was already available at APS. So she did those directly at APS, which was also writing back to the same file folder tree that was being monitored by Globus Online. So um, as soon as the reconstructions were done, they got piped back to PNNL. So within a few minutes, that we were able to use our visualization tools to analyze them. So it took about approximately 15 minutes to do the reconstruction and then about 10 minutes to do our analysis. So within about 25 minutes, which is the time it takes to run the instrument for one sample, we were actually able to get a visualization on the sample. So for a very first time, we thought, oh, that's, we were really happy with that. Um, the, they were excited, you know, at the beam, at at the beam line, they, um, they just turned on their laptop and turned on the tool, and they didn't have to ask for help from any of the um, staff that were working there. So they were like super ecstatic that it, it was that easy to use. And she did not have to cart back a hard drive because all of her data was already at PNNL before she left. So our next thing that we're working on, we were very happy with Globus Online. So the software that I've been developing at PNNL for a while is called Velo, and it's a scientific knowledge management system. So it, you know, helps the users design their experiments and submit jobs to HPC machines and monitor them and bring the results back and capture all the provenance and the relation. And we have data set objects and we have remote link objects and capture all the data in a provenance graph so that you can discover what happened and have accountability reports and all that stuff and but you know right it's been working okay in our little PNNL microcosm and um, for the 
the existing projects, they didn't have big data, so it was fine using traditional transfer mechanisms. But now we're getting big data and it's just not cutting it, so we definitely need a new mechanism for getting the data around quicker. So since we definitely want to look at using Globus online, I think it would integrate really well for that. Um, so like I said, we have these remote data nodes would be really cool to um, link to Globus online date. We were excited about yesterday the presentation on data sets API. I think being able to link our data sets with the Globus online data set as like a remote data set would be really cool. Um, and uh, maybe we could, you know, get some more advanced APIs to communicate with Globus online. Um, CMIS is like super detailed content management API, it does a lot of stuff, but it has search and other kinds of things, so maybe one day we get there. I mean, it'll definitely help us when we're um, doing, as part of our job launching infrastructure for staging data and bringing remote data local, that would make everything run a lot faster, and for users just wanting to take the data that we have, that's in our high performance cluster file system and want to put a copy on their local hard drive, um, having the Globus Connect would make that go way faster too. So there's all kinds of really good things that it could help us with. Um, and like, um, we would definitely also be interested in directly integrating it into our pipelines so that um, they could just go get the data using Globus whenever they needed to get a piece of data that was located um, in a different spot. And, um, and then our last improvement, of course, on our end is we really need to improve our next step on our tools. We need to um, take out these UI components that prevent us from being able to run these in an automated pipeline in the background and uh, try to see if our users will let us help them parallelize some of the code so it can run faster. Um, so that, that's my quick overview, hopefully. <laughs> Does, any questions? Yeah. Uh, very cool stuff. Uh, I'm just curious about um, how are you implementing um, uh, polling or recurrence? Are you just polling the sys file system, or are you using some system events to figure out when the image is available? How do you figure out when image is halfway written and not transferring that? We don't. It was super easy. We just actually, Globus Online does that for us. Because it's like it's really like calling us our sync over SSH. It's that easy. You just you don't even have to know. It automatically goes through the whole tree and it finds the data that anything that's new that is or had, has been changed since the. So you have like a mirrored image. So right. it looks at your destination and sees if there's any files in the source that are have a different timestamp or um, or non-existent on this destination, it'll automatically transfer them for so you. Maybe you should ask the Globus guys what mechanism are they Probably, using? Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the question here is maybe you have just one user, right? If you have 100 users who start polling something on Lustre file system, you know, the Lustre guys will not be very happy. Uh, I guess I've got a similar question. Um, you talked about wanting to integrate this into, into larger workflow, mm -hmm. uh, workflow systems. When I think about, um, Experimental sources like APS. I mean, there are. I mean, there are plenty of these around the country. It makes me wonder about a message broking, a message broker uh, system, rather than rather than looking just at data transfer. Whether it makes sense to connect it into into a you know a, a, a reliable high speed message broker uh, service, so that you can handle hundreds of users and things like that. I don't know if, if you have explored that when you're looking at other workflows. We actually have a workflow engine at PNNL. It's called Medici, and it's based on an enterprise services bus, so it's exactly that. It's all message driven, it's asynchronous, um, and that does, is a good environment for handling streaming data. So we, we don't have an actual pipeline yet to test stream. We are running pipelines on it, but they're not streaming the data. They're, you know, the data's already there, and then we run it. Um, but we definitely want to investigate. Um, but still, if there's an outside, I mean, most of the, the pipelines that I've done since I'm new to chemical imaging have been for more traditional, like, subsurface modeling and climate and stuff like that, where a lot of these guys are energy building modeling. So they, do, they will have, like, some data sets that are reference data sets that are just plain old input. Um, and those kind of data we could definitely, get, you know, get over and preload um, using a, a module that we define as a Globus Online um, data 
module to be able to access the data. But for streaming data, that's just coming straight off the instruments. Um, theoretically, we could, I mean, it's just a trigger, just an event-based trigger, so I'm pretty sure we could start taking our processing pipelines and just converting them into Medici and being able then to have them be triggered um, in real time instead of waiting till everything's done and run. Although this particular pipeline, the reconstruction, all of the um, data has to be completed before they can do it. So we couldn't even do this one in real time. I mean, it, we couldn't stream it anyway because they have to wait till all the data, all the images are taken before they can do their reconstruction. At least that's what they told me because <laughs> I'm not a specialist in this image science. <clears throat> I had a question. Um, what are you doing for your data transfer now? Uh, you know, before Globus Online? What we do now is we, we just create a, we, a, a programmatic SSH connection and do an SCP over um, from the whatever sort. We try to make this really generic framework so that we do not require the destination HPC environment to have any special software installed. Um, but then we can, but it's customizable so we can add specific behavior for, for specific servers if we know that they have better mechanisms. So that's our traditional mechanism. And for the, a lot of our processes that we've run didn't need a lot of input data. So they were more computationally intensive, but not so much data intensive. And so they worked great with this kind of framework. But now that we're getting, we're trying it on more data intensive pipelines and stuff, then we need something that's gonna go a lot faster. Great, thank you so much. Thanks. Mary.